Nuruddin Farah for me it's the fourth conversation um, we've recorded two conversations before uh, with him speaking on various issues to do with his books and I think today we are here most of you know why we are here it's that this book um, is now 50 years old it was published in 1970 um, I wasn't born yet half the room wasn't born yet our mothers were being convinced to get us born um, and there is a, the, the question of women being convinced to be mothers and wives etc is in the book here um, Lord Infara will introduce himself so I'll just ask him to actually tell you his real name because nowadays you never know uh, you might be calling him Nuruddin Farah, but he has another <coughs> name. So Nuruddin, um, just tell the audience your real name and your childhood name. Well, my good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be sitting here and talking to you. Uh, this is quite a dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, just get the other way. Why don't I just use yeah. Well, in Africa, we never seem to get the mics, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my mother used to call me no. It's only when I did something wrong that upset her that she would call me Nur El Dido, <laughs> <laughs> which obviously is the same sort of thing. The only thing is she would put emphasis on the name. Uh, and I don't remember in Nairobi sitting in a small room and talking to as many people as I'm talking to now. Possibly people have come to find out if I'm still alive, or if, I'm alive <laughs> if I'm 190 years old. And the reason is because they've been hearing the name. I can guarantee to you that I am okay, I'm healthy and that this book was actually written 52 years ago. I was a young student He's passing some secrets. <laughs> the other thing that's very important to mention is that From Crooked Drip is not my first novel. There were two novels before From a Crooked Drip. And I have no idea where the manuscripts are. I had sent the manuscript of the first novel called, at that time, it was called To Make a Deal, to my American, to a publishing house in America, in New York. They liked it and they asked me to revise the manuscript. And I lost interest in it. And then wrote another novel and again lost interest in it. But the one novel that kept me grounded and that made it possible for me to think that I could submit it to a publisher was from a Crooked Rib. Now, Crooked Rib has become, in a way, mythical because when I sent it to the publishing house, the editor, James Curry, who would become my editor, wrote a letter to me, in those days there were no emails, so he wrote a letter to me and he said, 
we would like to ask you one simple question. Are you a man or a woman? Which is, which is, which is why I wanted to ask you. Which is why I want to ask you um, two questions that I think you can respond. What does this book really mean to you? It's 50 years old. You say 52. So it has grandchildren, right? And then what really motivated you? Because you have a book whose subject, the lead character, and the subject matter, in a way, at that time, stretched the boundaries of what would have been seen as acceptable in the society where it was set. So what does that mean to you today? Well, the book was not received well when it came out first. <laughs> And even, there are some people who actually said that if I had written, instead of writing about a young Somali woman coming from the countryside to a town and then coming to the city, if I had written about a boy, the book would have done very well. And the reason is because it was fashionable at that time to write about boys growing up, being circumcised, and going through puberty and all that. Ngugi Othiongo is one such name that we can think of. There was also the African Child, which by Kamala Lai. There were a number of other novels by African authors writing about boys growing up. And all these bo books became bestsellers. No one, in fact, bothered to review from a crooked book when it came out. It had never been reviewed until after I published many other novels. But it has many, many stories, some of which I will have to tell you tonight. And one of the reasons why it has many stories is because it traveled by word of mouth. People telling each other, this is a book that you must read. With no reviews and no name recognition, and the fact that I was living in Mogadishu at the time, where the language, the medium of instruction of the schools was in Italian, and so on and so forth, all these things began to downplay the importance of the novel and the subject matter. Because this novel also precedes what we now today as feminism, much of feminism, it, it didn't help coming out at that time. One or two other fascinating stories about the fact you know, about my editor publishing, writing uh, to me and asking if I was a man or a woman. Till this day, I receive letters addressed to Mrs. Farah <laughs> because they think that I, am, I must be a woman. And when I had a wife, it was easier because I would give the letters to her and say, you know, please deal with it. Now, living in an apartment alone, I don't know what to do with them. And when the novel was translated into a Slovenian, a Slovenian woman who read it wrote to me a, 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 a letter at that time, care of the publishing house, in which she said, between us women, <laughs> since men will not know or understand, I want you to know, and so on and so on. Okay. okay. Which then leads to the question that um, today I'm assuming that if Ebla was alive, she would be in her 70s, right? Uh, do you think her situation, the situation you think of creatively in the book, would be better than when she, when she sought freedom by running away from the village uh, to the city? Because she's running away from, from a marriage that is likely to happen if she stays around. Do you think her situation would be better today, still in the context in which you wrote the book, 
I doubt it's whether my TPS situation would be any better today. And the reason is because the situation of women in much of Africa and much of the world has changed very little. And it continues to be a struggle for one to be a woman and to have the life comparable, similar to that of a boy. Because of the restrictions that occur, because also in Somalia today, given the civil war that's raging, things will be different. And I'll tell you one thing in confidence. We will have to presume no one else is listening to us. <laughs> Go ahead. I wrote, rewrote the prelogue, the prologue of this novel. Two months ago, Two months there, ago. Is, there is a different prologue that will appear in a different format. We are making a film based on film of Kurukumbe. <laughs> and because of the way films work, I have decided to give you the different prologue so that you will have Ebla, who is now elderly in, the 70s. in her early 70s and who now lives in Toronto and who is telling the story of her life to a granddaughter whom her mother wants to bring back to the Horn of Africa to have her infibulated. And she fought very, very hard to make sure that that daughter is not circumcised. And so she tells the story of her life to this granddaughter. Since you are not listening, um, I'll ask, you didn't hear that, right? It was just between the two of us. I'll ask the next question. So Ebla's search in the book is really a search for her humanity. Um, uh, because she's searching for individual freedom and the way the story is constructed, the individual freedom, there's no individual freedom unless it's founded in a community, right? And so um, then the question arises that this search actually literally, literally and literally is founding the entire corpus of your writing. For me, is this a literary project? Is this something you decided that I am going to be writing about the search for humanism? Uh, the most recent book, The Dawn of Sound, uh, which is uh, 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 North of Dawn, which is behind there, going back to uh, hiding in plain sight, going back to crossbones, going back to links, if you go backwards, all the way to Ebla's situation. Is a search, is a, a search for humanism. Is this a literary project? Well, I did not start off thinking that I would be able to do it. Remember, I was 22 years old, a second year university in India, and obviously dealing with every problem that a young 22-year-old person has to deal with. And I wasn't very good, at, you know, at university. And the reason is because in my second year I had already written two novels by the time I come to this, to from Krukadu. And therefore, my attitude towards writing was one that benefited me to clarify the ideas that I might entertain, ideas that I might have. How do I go about searching in search, you know, the quest for freedom when I come from a country that has suffered colonialism, that has suffered conquest, that has gone through all this, and as a human being, as a human being, 
I am not considered even to be a human being in a number of countries in Europe, America, and so on and so forth. So I wasn't looking at myself as a person. I was looking at myself as a member of humanity, negotiating all the difficulties that one is supposed to come across. And at that time, fortunately for me, I came across a play by a Norwegian author, playwright, called Ibsen. And the play is called The Doll's House. What fascinated me at that time, at the age of 22, was to see that the principal character in the play, towards the end of the play, leaves her husband, closes the door, and says, to hell with you, and with everything else that you represent. And there came the opening of the novel. There is this woman who lives in a middle class family, married, not quite happily. And if she could leave whatever comforts that she had, I thought Ebla, at the age of 18, whose hand has been given in marriage to a man who is 62 years of age, she will have no life. And therefore, she thought, it's time for me to go. And go in search of my own humanity. And the reason is because I have no life to live here. But still, Nordin, the question that's really disturbing about this book is this. If you read the entire corpus of early writing on uh, feminist literature from Africa, believe you me, you will not get a mention of, from a crooked rib. And yet, this is exactly the kind of book every feminist would walk around with and say, ah, so the wind of the late 70s and 80s of African feminist scholarship, how did it ignore this? Which because then I was comes, a man. Because I was a man. <laughs> and, but why were you as a man writing what is really, uh, if you've read Nawal El Maybe Sarri. because I was pretending to be a woman. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, okay, that, that's, that's, that's really an answer. That's, that's, it's a profound answer because um, if you read the book and you read Woman at Point Zero by Nawal El Sadawi, then you're wondering how comes um, um, a book from Egypt and a book from Somalia two profound books about African feminism, in a way, have not really been part and parcel of the conversation on African feminism. But now you've given us an answer. <coughs> um, the next question is, you are a transnational subject. Um, and I don't mean it in a theoretical sense. So, so Nurudin uh, claims to be a citizen of Baidoa, and uh, Nuruddin uh, has uh, Ethiopian uh, uh, relationship. Nuruddin has Kenyan relationship. Today, do you say you're South African? Um, how have your travels, how have your living elsewhere, and these elsewhere, uh, impacted your thinking and your creativity? Well, I think. It must be very important to say that if I stand up now and I stand on a piece of ground, that on which I'm standing becomes invisible to me. What I'm trying to say is that being distant from Somalia, living in India, to which I went when I was 19, enabled me to take 
a very concentrated look into Somalia. It enabled me to see a Somalia that I would not have seen had I continued to live in Somalia along with my with the members of the family, etc., etc. And therefore, distance distills. Distance makes you see better. You see? And I'm one of those who have benefited from being in exile. When I was writing the books on dictatorship against Siad Barre, and he was, you know, threatening me with detention if I arrived in Somalia, sentenced me to death, did all kinds of terrible things, uh, endangered my life, physically endangered my life more than once. The reason why I was able to think of all this was because I was able to think freely. If I had lived on in Somalia to write a novel called Sweet and Sour Milk, Sardines or Close Sesame, which are about dictatorship, the first person who would come to me would be my mother. My mother would say to me, my son, I love you. And there is nothing special about you. <laughs> Why do you stick your neck out? What is it in, in it for you to do these dangerous things? I do not want you to die. I do not want you in prison. I want you to work at a bank, make a good salary, bring it. Get married. Get married. Bring the drugs. <laughs> exactly. And you are about writing books. I am writing books, but my mother, bless her soul, understood. And you know why? Because she was a poet. And she knew that there was <laughs> that there was a special link between her and me. Apart from the fact that she was a poet who did not produce much poetry because she had given birth to nine children. If she had not given to nine children, I'm quite sure she would have become a greater poet because she would have had the time to produce poetry. Instead of producing poetry, what did she do? She continued producing children. <laughs> <laughs> so these are the things that are also makes the difference between men and women. Men, men, because they do not carry a baby for nine months and then give birth to them and so on and so forth have more time to write books than women. Now, the reason I asked you about the idea of the transnational is that the, the kind of received wisdom about Somali and, Somali and its troubles is that there's a kind of an argument that there is the problem of the countryside and the city. And remember, Ebla, uh, crosses the boundaries. And you just say crossing boundaries enables you to see the world in new and different ways. Uh, can you speak a little bit to this question of crossing boundaries, especially for women characters in your book? Well, if there are boundaries, boundaries are to be crossed. And the boundary that she crosses, it's not the only boundary that actually exists. There are boundaries that are invisible to, the, to people. And Ebla, the first boundary that she crosses is when she wakes up that morning. And without knowing where she was going, thought to herself that she preferred to have freedom of choice and living in freedom to being in servitude and in comfort. And that is the boundary that she crossed. 
by the time she comes to the town, she had already made up her mind that there was no going back. And by the time she moves from there to the city of Mogadishu, she is a completely different person because she is raped by the man who claims to have become her husband. And as a woman, as a woman, she will have no support. Because when we're talking about search for freedom, when we're talking about being on a quest for freedom, it's allowed for men to do it, to go through this adventure. But women are not. And I'll tell you somebody else who actually loved this book and who told me how much he loved it and then asked me a question that shocked my sister. I met Chinua Achebe in 1973 in Kampala at a conference where he was going to be speaking about the English language and the African writing. And because he was the editor at the time of Heinemann African Writing Series, Achebe told me how much he liked the book. And then he asked me the question, did it sell well? <laughs> I was shocked because I was thinking, here's this great writer whom I'm meeting for the first time. I'm 26, 27 years of age. And I wanted him to talk to me about the value of the book, the literary value of the book. Instead, he was asking me if the book sold or did not sell. Money matters in life, right? <laughs> now, 